G'day, everybody, and welcome to this week's Scale-Ups podcast. My guest today is John Spence. Um, and John, is, if you haven't heard of John before, he is, uh, he's a lot of fun. Uh, John is he's an ex-CEO. He used to be a CEO and owner of uh, many different uh, businesses, and he spent the last, I don't know how many years, he's, he's an experienced guy. He reads 100 books a year on leadership and strategy and execution and people and you know he's got a super wide reference and he he's got five books he's a coach he's an author he's a speaker he does a whole bunch of things but what he's really good at is taking this super wide reference set that he's got looking for the patterns and then distilling them down into really sensible and clear steps plus of course all his own personal experience and the experience of the founders and the ceos that he mentors so i think you're really going to love that so we really dig into three topics today one around strategy how do you do how do you get really clear about you know your your growth strategy Two, what are some of the really key principles that are going to help you execute better? And then three, how do you lead your people uh, in such a way that you help them get the most out of themselves so they can maximize their contribution um, to the organization? Um, so I think you're really going to enjoy the sort of the breadth in this conversation today. There's absolutely something that you're going to take away. Make sure you listen all the way to the end uh, because right towards the end, John also gives you his personal email address. If you've got questions for him, he is uh, very happy to answer them. Uh, have a great uh, time listening today and I hope you get lots of value out of it. Thanks a lot. Welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where each week you get to hear Sean Steele, professional CEO, growth mentor and advisory board chair, unpack the strategies that successful founders have used to achieve scale in their businesses. Stay tuned as he interviews the entrepreneurs who've made it, learns from industry experts and follows a group of founders still striving to scale. G'day everyone and welcome to the Scale Ups podcast where we help first time founders learn the secrets of scaling so they can fulfill the potential of their businesses essentially. We want them to make bigger decisions with greater confidence and maximize the impact they can have in the world. Uh, I am your host, uh, Sean Steele. I'm a, not a guest. I was about to call myself a guest. I'm the host today <laughs> and you're the guest, John. <laughs> yes, uh, you're on show. How do you like that? <laughs> uh, welcome, uh, John Spence. How are you today, mate? I'm excellent, man. And you? I'm I'm fabulous. Really thrilled to have you. Um, you know, for people who uh, may not have come across your work before, John, you are a global top 100 business thinker. I saw you um, in the growth faculty, um, and you're doing a workshop there. You're you know a top 500 uh, leadership development expert. You're a consultant, an educator, a coach, a, a speaker. You got five books, uh, five business and life success books, including awesomely uh, simple essential business strategies for turning ideas into action, uh, which I have gone and looked at your um, some of the excellent toolbox stuff that you've got on your website, which I absolutely loved. I know you're guest lecturing um, at more than 90 colleges around the world, including like MIT and Stanford and Wharton, who clearly have high standards. Uh, and most importantly for this podcast, you've owned or been the CEO of at least uh, six companies. And so we know your insights come from experience, which of course is, um, is really important to this kind of audience. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, maybe a little bit of context for today. You know, you, you built this career around... Um, I guess on a sort of foundation of making the very complex awesomely simple, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and our and our audience is typically in that sort of one to twenty mil uh, revenue range, and so that's mm -hmm. what they like, right? They're super practical; they're not into lots of complexity. And yeah. um, and you've been looking at, you know, you've been sort of distilling. You've had the opportunity to distill your own successes, but also the success of lots of other um, CEOs and founders that you've worked with. And from a timing perspective, by the time this goes live, we're going to be, you know, in the beginning of twenty twenty three, and. Um, I know what happens uh, when you get, you know, I just released a podcast uh, a few days ago, which had some you know, questions for founders to reflect on. And I know what happens in holidays. Sometimes you either keep working all the way through and you do no reflecting, uh, or it's the last thing that you want to do and you actually just need to completely decompress. But what I would really love to get out of today is sometimes people hit February and realize they actually haven't taken a step back and thought about 2023 yet and how they're going to really optimize that year. And they're just stuck in the doing and they've got all the tasks and they're just executing, but they haven't thought about have I really taken a step back and th thought about my strategy? Have I thought about what I might need to prioritize to make my execution in my team better? And then what about how I lead my people? How do I help them uh, be better um, this year? So that's really where I wanted to go um, today. How does Perfect. that sound to you? Excellent. Sounds great. Beautiful. Well, it's a bit of a broad landscape I painted, but maybe we start on um, strategy and you know, some of your sort of frameworks and principles around that. I know you've got the five levels um, or five pillars uh, of strategic thinking, but how did you think about strategy that's effective and some of the ingredients that get you there? Well, well, dude, I'll give this a two-part answer. One, when you talk about reflecting, one of the keys to being a good strategic thinker is you have to set time aside to read, study, learn, look at the industry. 
Um, it, there's a, a great saying, a computer saying, garbage in equals garbage out. I think it's the same thing with strategy. If you haven't taken the time to study, look at other companies, read, you know, read things on strategy and business, you're not getting enough new information in to create something positive on the other side. Mm. From a strategy standpoint, I, I let's make things simple. I think there's just one equation that really sums up the core of strategy and that all strategy is just valued differentiation multiplied by disciplined execution. And let me explain that. There's four elements to this. Okay. So, you know, I challenge everyone I work with, if we can figure out how your strategy meets these four elements, you're going to crush it. Number one, you must bring something that is unique and compelling to the marketplace. That doesn't mean it has to have a hundred bells and whistles because the next one is that your target market will be happy to pay for, pay any reasonable price. So I don't have to have the best thing in the world. I just have something that my customers go, I don't care if it's $5 or 50,000 or 50 million, happy to write a check for that. Number three, and this one's tough, that is difficult, if not impossible to copy. And then number four is that I can execute with excellence consistently. So let me do those again real quick. Bring something that's unique and compelling that your target customer is happy to pay for, that is difficult, if not impossible to copy, and that you can consistently execute it with excellence. If you can create a strategy that meets those four criteria, you will stand out dramatically from your competition. Oh, I love that, John. You're speaking my language. You know, when I think about the the sort of strategy roadmap that I take um, clients uh, through and that I'm currently building a course around, all of those four ingredients are uh, core and central um, to the way that we take people through it. So I'm really excited that you didn't give me something that I hadn't even thought of, um, but, you, you know, but you've articulated it in a much more simple way than I probably do. There's which darn I nothing to talk about that most people don't know. It's just applying it. I mean, you, thing, you right? said it. Um, when I'm, you know, right now, I don't know if we're going to be in a recession in the United States when this airs mm -hmm. in, you know, in February 23, somewhere in there. Yeah. But when I went through the global financial crisis the last time, we called it the Great Recession. There was three things I noticed where companies struggle. And I, I see this all the time with my clients, but during that time, it was especially critical. Number one was the lack of a vivid, compelling, and well-communicated vision and strategy for growth. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, maybe the senior team thought about it a little, maybe they didn't even have that clear. And when I say senior team, this is a million dollar company to a billion dollar company. It's all basically the same. The way I look at it, it's just more zeros, but the mm -hmm. fundamentals of doing a company really, really well don't change dramatically with, with scale. The fundamentals are still there. So number one was lack of a vivid, compelling, and well-communicated, underline that eight times, yeah. vision and strategy for growth. Yeah. Number two was lack of courageous communication. People mm -hmm. knew there were issues. They were going to probably lose some customers, might have to lay somebody off, but they were afraid to sit down and, and talk you know, openly and honestly. There was a lack of psychological safety. So people were just quiet and hoped that things got better. Hope is not a strategy. And then the last one, which is the, the second most important thing that I see in business is communication is always the biggest issue, no matter what company, even if there's only one person, yeah. <laughs> you're going to have a hard time communicating with your customers, but uh, it's lack of disciplined execution and accountability. Mm -hmm. it, it's one thing to have a great strategy. It's a completely different thing to execute it uh, consistently again with excellence. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think about, you know, one of the, I had a really interesting guest this year um, and we spent the majority of the time talking about the execute. They had a great strategy. They'd worked with a consultant. We actually interviewed the consultant who helped them build the strategy. And then we interviewed mm -hmm. the CEO who deployed the strategy and they'd taken that company from 25 to 50 million over a few years. Um, but what was really interesting was the execution components and how they actually created cross-functional teams, really clear metrics, absolute transparency and visibility. Like people were engaged. They felt like they owned the strategy. They were accountable to it. Each of the big initiatives, to your point, like there's usually a couple of big initiatives that fall out of a strategy that are going to make you um, get yeah. you to that sort of, you know, super valuable and, and compelling offer that people are willing to pay for. Um, and how do you bring visibility and accountability to those? Otherwise, everyone just gets busy doing um, and doing the stuff, right? Like you can have a very busy year, but that doesn't mean you're actually advancing the company. It doesn't mean you're going to be a, a better company in four or five years. You might be a bigger company, but you may not be a better one, yeah. Um, yeah. which I always think is a really key part. And actually, one of the things that you said there is the, is the courage. Um, what do you find, do you find it challenging um, with some uh, founders to to have them let go of some stuff? Because sometimes when you go through a strategy process, right, you um you know, you think I, I heard from a guy called uh, Jamie Christofferson, who was that consultant. He had, he runs this 
what he calls the three gods test, which is the three Hindu gods. One, which is about um, essentially the things that are new. Uh, one is about the one God is about the things that are to be maintained, the things that are working, the things that are special, the secret source. And one is actually about the things that you have to let go to create space for the other two. Um, and I find that's really difficult for founders to do because to your point, it takes courage. You might've started a yeah. whole bunch of things, but it's really hard to let go of them because it could there could be jobs that go with it. There could be teams that go with it. It could be a whole bunch of things. What, what's your experience and how do you help people get to the letting go part, John? Yeah, I teach them a new word. No, <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're not going to invest in that. You know, Because strategy basically it's, gets down to the allocation of scarce resources. Mm. Uh, and if you try to be all things to all people, you're nothing to anybody. If you try to implement 27 strategies, you have no strategy. Uh, and years ago when I was getting ready to, to, to teach at one of the top universities, I went back and revisited this and I, a couple things that I took away that were sort of epiphanies back then is one is one of the most important things a great strategic thinker can do is figure out what to say no from, uh, for that we're, we're not going to do that anymore. Another one is realizing that even if you're great at it, strategy is still a guess. It's a, a thoughtful, well-reasoned guess, but nobody knows the future. Uh, so you're trying to take those scarce resources and create the best perception of what you believe the, the, the future is going to look like, and then be very, very focused about where you spend your time, money, and people, have a lot of discipline around that, and then take massive execution, massive action around that clear direction. It's really hard for founders, especially right. you know if it's a, as the company starts to grow and they have to start delegating things away. Um, you know, for, for, I've started a couple of companies. It's like your baby. You, know, you, want, you want to go here, look after this for me. Uh, you're like, no, no, I'm the one that knows how to do this. Mm -hmm. That's another stage where you have to say, no, that's not my area of expertise. That's why I hired you. You're fantastic at that, John. You handle that. And I have to trust it because you're great. And I've hired the best talent I can. You're going to run out and do a fantastic job on behalf of the company. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. And so then, uh, and because I think also sometimes when you... Uh, when they're smaller, sometimes the big challenge is they can't afford anybody who's, you know, who probably is maybe thinking at a higher level in a certain functional area than them. But that's there's always an opportunity to add advisors, right? Like you can always get fractional CMOs and CEOs and CFOs and whatever. It's like they don't have to cost a lot of money, but elevating your thinking with somebody who's actually going to bring something to the table so that all that weight's not on you is a big um, part of it. But then when you can afford one, the worst thing you could do is to micromanage them and go, okay, let me tell you how we're going to do this strategy. And you're thinking, you just hired hey, somebody who's got, you know, who's got all the juice, right? That would give, give them some room. You know, it's fascinating. I, I had, uh, went to my, one of my friend's houses last night for dinner, a whole bunch of us, they're all business owners catching up. And I asked them a really interesting question, which I'll ask you and you can, I know you're supposed to ask the questions on this, but I'll, no, I'll ask fine. you and I'll tell you what I, what I said. Then you can tell me, I said, what's been great about the pandemic? What's been, and everybody had different answers. Uh, a couple of them said, now I, I realize I'm getting more sleep. I'm more effective than I was. I get to spend time with my family. Mine was, I, I much like our call, uh, I've increased my network worldwide. That now mm. that I can get on Zoom with somebody, I, I have advisors and a network and helpers that can give advice from, from anywhere on the globe just as easily as walking next door and talking to my next door neighbor. Uh, the other thing is, is it's, this is a big realization for me, for employers, the world is your talent pool now. It used to be you, you hired somebody that came into the office every day. I've got one client who's in Vancouver. Their team is spread out all over the world, the Philippines, Egypt, everything. Mm -hmm. They hired a team of developers in Egypt for what it would have cost to hire one developer in yeah. uh, Vancouver. The other side of that coin is for talented people. The world is now your employer. Yeah. Uh, I If I don't like where I am and I'm not being treated well and I'm not being challenged, oh. I can go anywhere I want to go. So what, what's your answer to that? I'm throwing it back. What what was great about the pandemic for you? And that's a hard uh, way to say it, but. Yeah, two two things for me, one from a personal perspective and one from a business perspective. From a personal perspective, yeah, like you, all of a sudden it, um, it you know, for myself and my family actually created complete location independence. All the work that I do is location independent. And as a result, I'm actually moving to Europe in 11 months time with my family. We're like sold the house. The kids are going to be in like boarding school and university in Europe and so we're changing our world, but I'm still going to be running this business as I do it today. I'm just going to be doing it from a different a different country. So that's been wonderful um, for me. But um, what I've loved about what it's done for um, for founders is it has changed. It's like 
it's disrupted some really normalized mindsets. So mm-hmm. it started to make people a bit more open because they've been through something that was so unpredictable. They're like, huh, like it's been, a, it feels like it's been a while. Okay. Yes. There's been some recession, okay. GFC and so on. And people who've been around for long enough have seen some disruption, but not many people have seen, uh, had an experience where like, it's not even close to being predictable. Like you have absolutely no idea how this is going to play out. And that has, I think, helped people shift some of those really stuck mindsets like where is my talent pool? Like what's my business model? Like, okay, you know, how do I understand my industry and where we can play? I think it's really thrown up a lot of balls in the air and people have had the opportunity to catch them in different ways. Yeah, I've been focusing a lot lately. uh, I teach a class on the future of leadership and we talk about three quotients that I believe it takes to be a great leader in the future. IQ, EQ, and AQ. IQ is not the number, it's competence. Mm -hmm. Are you really good at what you do? EQ, obviously, is your emotional quotient, your ability to get along with other people, Mm -hmm. to collaborate, which we've now figured out through research, and it's pretty just stands to reason. If you can't get along with other people, no matter how bright you are, it doesn't really matter. So Mm -hmm. EQ is actually more important than IQ. If I'm pretty competent and I get along well with people, I go a lot further. But the last one is AQ, your adaptability or agility quotient. Mm -hmm. And we we just hit on a little bit in strategy, this first step in agility or adaptability or AQ is voracious learning, constantly mm. trying to spend more time, get more things, learn more things. But number two gets right, is voracious unlearning, is what doesn't work anymore, changing that mental, you know, this might have worked before, but now things mm. have completely changed in the marketplace or with my customer or something. Mm. And you have to have, the, again, the courage to say, I'm even though that's worked for years, it's not going to work anymore. Yeah, that's so true. And I think it's very easy. The the bigger a business scales, I notice one of the things that seems to be one of the biggest gaps is often um, leaders get further away from their customers uh, and they don't have, they haven't got into their execution rhythms, built a good feedback mechanism where the, you know, the leaders are required to chat to a customer every week or have got the right kinds of feedback loops coming back from their team. And so you lose strategic agility super fast when something's going on with your customer base, the decisions they've made are changing, the industry is changing, the drivers are changing, and you're still doing the same old thing. And all of a sudden, you're a year and a half down the line and everybody else is taking your customers and you're wondering why, because no one's talking to them. You've um, just hit one of the things that I jump up and down with. I do, I do a pretty fair amount of executive coaching. And one of the first things I want to ask is how often do you go out to your stores or how often do you go actually talk to a customer? Yeah. And I hear, you know, I've had a lot of CEOs. I don't have time. Like if you don't have time to talk to them, you're going to have time for bankruptcy. How's that sound champ? <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a question that I, <laughs> that I don't have time. Well, you're going to have plenty of time on your hands soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a question I've taught a lot of my clients. I think is it's super easy, but it's incredibly powerful. And it's changed mm-hmm. many of their companies is go to a group of your top talent, your top customers, uh, the ones you'd like to have lots more of, and mm-hmm. then ask them this simple question. Why specifically do you do business with us? What are the top three or four reasons? If you ask enough of your A clients that a pattern will emerge, that pattern is basically your brand. Mm. Uh, And that pattern is what your unique selling proposition is in the marketplace. And when I've had folks that have done that, they look at it and they go, okay, there's four things that all of our clients mostly spend money on us for. I'm betting that if your best clients are spending on these four things, all your potential clients will likely spend money on the same three or four things. Mm. The ones that have embraced that, here's the interesting thing, Sean, is a lot of, a lot of them don't go out and, don't want to go out and out talk to their customers. I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, we don't, we don't have time. <laughs> well, that's not going to work so good. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's so true. So let's say, okay, we've got a founder here. Um, they've, They've gone, you know, John, that's incredibly simple. Okay, I've, I've come up with a reasonable strategy, I think, for this is the growth of the business. Now I need to execute it. Um, so we're not quite yet at team, but we're thinking, okay, how am I going to sort of plan this execution? What should I be prioritizing? How do I, how do I build the right kind of rhythms of accountability? How do I get the system of executing in place? What, how do you think about that? I, um, I have another word I use there is accountability, basically. You know, we're going to execute this. So I'm going to take, uh, take accountability for getting this part of it done. I look at a couple things. The first thing to me is extreme clarity about what we're trying to achieve. There's actually five things I think that it takes to create a culture of accountability or disciplined execution. Number one is 100% clarity. If I'm going to hold you accountable for something, I need to sit down and, and in as much detail as possible, tell you this is what success looks like. Here's how we're going to measure it. This is the due date. Here's your budget. Here's your decision-making authority. So you've got to get 100% clarity plus appropriate authority and resources. That's Mm -hmm. step one. Mm -hmm. Step two, then, is 100% agreement. 
I need the person I'm going to hold accountable to, to explain back to me, this is what I have to do. This is when it's due, blah, 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 blah. I usually have them write a memo so we can sit down and look at it together. And then now we've got 100% agreement. Uh, you know what you're supposed to do. I agree with it. And then I always have them put a sentence or two at the bottom. Um, I believe this is a reasonable goal. I accept 100% accountability. And then we both sign it. Uh, it's a, called an accountability agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. Number three, then, is track and post. And part of that is uh, your you rhythm. That? When oh, are we going to get together? When are our one-on-ones? Would, on um, would that be Go like ahead. a one-year thing? Would that be like typically a once-a-year activity you would do? Um, oh, with the track and post? Yeah, the, the, um, the accountability agreement in terms of the clarity around their, their goals and what they need to get done and by when. I would, well, I do it until they've got that project done. So on every project, I'm going to hold somebody accountable. We're going to sit down and do that. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to, you know, get together on a one-on-one, -on -one, I would hope weekly uh, to say, how are you doing? Let's check this off. Do you need more resources? Do we have enough people on your team? Mm -hmm. uh, how can I help you? Well, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. So let, let me see if I answer that. If not, we can come back. Mm -hmm. So step three then is track and post. And that is your rhythm and, and using a dashboard or whatever it might be. Most of my clients use red, yellow, green. Uh, you know, green, I'm doing great. I'm meeting all my goals, deadlines. Yellow, I'm shaky. Red, I'm in trouble. You just get together every week say, how are you doing? What's going on here? You know, and, and which comes to level four, which is the big one is when someone slips from green to yellow, you don't yell at them. You go help them mm. uh, because most people think tracking is going to be punishment. They're tracking because I'm going to miss this or I'll get in trouble or withhold bonus or I won't get a raise or whatever it might be. Uh, what you need to teach people is, no, we're all on the same team. We all want to be green. So I want to check in with you constantly so that the minute something slips, we can work together to get you back in green, keep the whole company in green. Mm -hmm. So it's it's when it, when they start to struggle, step four is coach, mentor, train, support. Mm -hmm. uh, be there on their team. Get shoulder to shoulder with them. Help them. Then the last one, or actually two, I'll, I'll go it now. It's six, seven levels. Uh, I just make this stuff up, so I change numbers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> celebrate success. Deal decisively with mediocrity. If someone is delivering. Make a you know positive reinforcement. Uh, make an example. This is what we're looking for. Bob or Sue has been green all year, you know, doing all that stuff. If the person can't make it, at least everybody knows you tried, mm -hmm. that you were coaching and helping and supporting, and you couldn't get them back into yellow or green. They just stayed in red. Then when they leave the company, people at least know. I mean, I've got a favorite Jack Welsh quote. Uh, I never fired anybody who was surprised. Mm -hmm. So the idea is if, if there's con now. Constant communication about it. You said something, is it once a year? For me, it's every time a project gets going yeah. and it's constant check-ins. And from a strategy standpoint, to me, it's a weekly check-in on strategy, a quarterly, at least a half a day where yeah. you're going over it. And then I'm a big fan for making your strategy as simple as possible. Years ago, when I, I ran a large company, I got it down to about eight pages and we bound it in a, in a a red binder, we called it the red book, and said, every meeting you come to that we're going to make any decisions, bring the red book. Mm -hmm. And before we allocate resources or decide to do something, we're going to go through that and say, does it match our strategy? Does it match our values? Does it align with our purpose? If it doesn't, we're not doing it. Or we have to take the thing apart and build a new one, new red book. I really don't, I mean, it's got to be a pretty big deal for us to, to rip that thing up and start again. Yeah. And that was that, that thing that, that, kept consistency throughout the entire year. Mm, I love that. I think that visibility is um, being able to communicate it simply is so critical. You know, one of the things I do at the end of my process with my, um, with clients when I'm taking through the strategy process is I give them two documents, one, which is a PowerPoint version because they often are, you know, doing virtual meetings and whatever I need to explain it to people. And it might be seven, eight slides tops, but I also give them a desktop background that people can put on their background. So every single person in the company who's all, you know, most of them are working virtually anyway, they can see, that entire picture. So from purpose to the brand promises, the brand guarantees, the differentiators, the the big bets, the big the key initiatives, the success metrics of those initiatives, the financial goals, the priorities for this year, like all of that is in one page. So they're always having to come back to that doc. All of it, someone just goes, hang on a second, just I'm just going to share screen here. This is what we said we were going to do. And that's not what we're talking about. So it, it, it kind of brings that. Um, that's a genius up. idea. Yeah, uh, it's been great. They, they seem to really love it. So what about, um, that's awesome. And I think, um, you know, execution's hard, right? Like this is where, the, this is where the, the, the does, I don't feel like there's enough kind of courses on execution. Like there's plenty of stuff on strategy and there's lots of stuff around vision and it's like, that's great. But you and I both know that when you're a CEO, 
the, the money's made and the value's created in execution. Um, yeah. Like assuming that you've got a great team and you know how to lead them, then actually those rhythms make all the difference, that visibility, that transparency, that accountability without, and I love that you're saying one of the most important things is to teach people that actually they're going to feel like someone's got their back. They're going to know that because we've been clear about the, the what, the why, the when um, up front, and you're responsible for the how, that when, if the how's not quite delivering, I'm going to be in your corner because I'm not going to be trying to micromanage you on the other stuff, right? Because I was clear about it up front. We both agreed it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people have a hard time with accountability and execution because they don't want to be mean. You know, they don't mm. want to be seen as to get this done or, you know, micromanaging or pushing people. I think when you sit down and get the real clear expectations before there's any problems or anything, sit down. That means what we can do is have the conversation that says, I think you're a great person. I like you a lot. You're a valuable team member. However, uh, you're not meeting your goals right now. And we all need to meet our goals. So what can I do to help you? How can we get you back in green? Because everybody wants the entire company to be in green. So it's not you. It's mm. your behavior. You're okay. Yeah. What you're delivering is not okay. Yeah. It's not an attack. It's a team. We're partners yeah. to get mm -hmm. this to happen. Yeah. Separate the person from the behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And so what about then uh, individuals? How do you think about... Um, leadership in the context of how do you help people? I mean, that's obviously one big part of helping people succeed is right. Is, is helping them understand what success looks like, which lots of people don't do, you know, like yeah. you get job descriptions, which is some gigantic list of tasks. I'm like, that's not what success looks like. That's a yeah. friggin' that's a list of tasks. Yeah. How many people have looked at that document since you put it together? No one, yeah. no one Nobody zero, looks zero, at that no. document until you ask them to do something that's outside the task list that you just gave them. They're like, Oh, it's not my task list. It's like, come, give me a break. I only ever built <laughs> best profiles. You know, they're, they're like three pages. One, like what does success look like for the individual, the purpose of the role, the character, you know, how, how do we want this person to show up and who we're looking for? Two is all their lead and lag uh, metrics on a, you know, what does success look like on a weekly or monthly basis? And then the third one is the key projects, the key deliverables for that year where it's absolutely, all that stuff's being made really clear. So to your point, the whole thing is called a success profile. That's yeah. what it's about. It's about how you succeed and then how I help you succeed. So, the, but what about from an individual perspective? Um, you know, I know you've got a lot of tools in your, um, in your toolbox, um, but how do you think about helping people then get the most out of themselves in the way that you, in the way that you provide support to them? Well, a couple of things. Uh, number one is I'm a fanatic for lifelong learning. I think if you're going to grow and get better, you got to constantly be learning everything you can. So I'll throw an interesting statistic at you. Um, the average college graduate reads about a half a book a year for business or personal improvement. Point five. Uh, to get better at sales or conflict resolution or better communications, whatever it might be, what I would call a skills-based book or the equivalent thereof, uh, videos, YouTubes, podcasts, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, half a book. Mm -hmm. If you were to read one every other month, six a year, you're in the top 1% of whatever country you live in. If you read 12 a year, you're in the top 1% on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is you have to invest in yourself, whether that's listening to podcasts, audio books, watching videos. Setting aside, and I think a minimum of 15 minutes a day. I set aside an hour a day, you know, and you can probably see behind me. I read, I've been reading an average of 100 business books a year since 1989. Yeah. It doesn't make me a genius. It just means I have access to more information. So step one is mm -hmm. approaching your, your job is not a job. It is a craft and you're a craftsperson mm -hmm. and you're constantly trying to get better. Uh, number two, from a leadership standpoint, again, I think reading, studying, watching, looking at leaders that you admire and I'm a huge fan for creating your own personal leadership philosophy mm -hmm. uh, to sit down and, and list out. If I could be the kind of leader I would want to work for, if I could really be a, a leader that people willingly follow, what would I do in creating that list? And then here's what I, with the executives I work with, I say, put that on your desk or put it on your, look at it every morning before you start work. Say, this is who I'm supposed to be today. This is the kind of leader I want to be. Then at the end of the day, before you leave, score yourself on a scale of one to 10 for each one of the items. 10 is I crushed it today. I was very kind. I showed a lot of appreciation. I was very thoughtful. I didn't cut people off, whatever it might be. Uh, and then if you drop below, and I used to hand it out to my staff when I had a large company, my entire executive team. And if I drop below a step, I, I would hand it out once a quarter and let them all write one to 10 or actually circle it so I couldn't see anybody's handwriting. And anywhere I dropped below a seven, I went to the team and apologized. And said, this is who I said I'd be. I hold you accountable, responsible for you doing your job. 
you got to hold me accountable for doing the job, the leadership job. And I fell down on this and I apologize and I'm sorry and I'll get better. But it's that con just like the rhythm, it's that constant in your face of this is who you're supposed to be mm -hmm. today and every day to lead this company well. Can I ask you a question about the first one? Because I've always really, I always found this really challenging. Like you, I'm a voracious uh, learner. And that's, you know, that's how you get to being a young CEO, right? Like, because yeah. you're, you're, you're always willing to take risks. You've got a super wide reference point. So I always think, you know, like if you've got, if you're a super deep technical specialist, but you're only like in one lane, your reference points and your ability to think kind of laterally or get perspective is, is much more limited. And if you're in a leadership role, that's, that's problematic, right? If you're in a technical specialist role, maybe it's not a problem. But so how do you, how did you think about, I guess, bringing people on that journey, you know, because sometimes you might, let's say you take a role as a CEO and it's not your business mm -hmm. and you've inherited a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. and the, this sort of um, tension between you wanting to, um, I guess, live and breathe what you believe is really important in terms of lifelong learning, mm -hmm. but how much can you sort of impose it on others? Like, you know, how have you thought about trying to get people on that journey? Because some people are naturally already there and they're, they're doing it. Some people can be inspired um, by seeing somebody else do it and seeing, you know, what they're getting out of it and benefits. And then some people just don't want to be on that journey and they don't want to do that learning. How have you, how, have you, how do you think about that in terms of trying to create a culture of um, self-development and personal development? You're not going to like my answer. <laughs> I don't let them stay in the company anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, when You know, I, I just got a small boutique consultancy now. I've got a couple mm -hmm. of employees too. And uh, they're both voracious learners, constantly doing stuff. But back in the old days, when I ran one of the Rockefeller Foundations, I gave everybody on my staff $1,000 a year and mm -hmm. said, I don't care what you spend this on, just something you learn. I don't care what you learn. I just want you to invest in mm -hmm. yourself something and we were sending them to training courses if someone didn't spend that money i they likely weren't going to come back the next year uh i get a lot of people that ask i'll give you a great example this quickly i get a lot of people that ask me to mentor them not executive coaching but students and things like that mm -hmm. hey will you help me i go i'm happy to love to do that what are you interested in learning about let's say say they see leadership i go great i need you to read the leadership challenge by kuzis and poser i need you to read this i need you to read you read three books Make a book report on each, come back and report to me. And if I feel like you got the book, I will absolutely got the books and nailed them. I will absolutely be your mentor. Mm -hmm. How many people in my life have ever done that? So a few. Four out of hundreds yeah. of people. They yeah. won't do the work. Mm -hmm. Years ago, someone said, you know, your business is kind of like a cult. And I said, Yeah, it's a cult of excellence. You have a problem with that? <laughs> 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 the only reason we're successful is kind of a lot of people that are much smarter and much better than I am. And I just try to keep them learning and growing and get the hell out of their way. <laughs> yeah. Geez, that's so interesting. And you know, um, a note to founders out there, because I know lots of founders and I've fallen, I've fallen into this trap myself when I thought, yeah, cause the natural inclination is like, well, I need to make learning available to people. Right. So they get a LinkedIn learning subscription or a plural site subscription or a skill self subscription or something like that, right? It's just then gajillions of sort of items. But that's kind of like giving people Spotify with no playlists and mm -hmm. no recommendations and saying, go. There's yeah. like 3 billion songs in there, just go. And they're like, huh? Like they're so overwhelmed by the amount of learning. Like if you can't, if you don't link that to quality conversations, like I've always built a rhythm of, you know, monthly, uh, monthly meetings with each person that we call zone ins. And the zone ins are three things. You're talking about um, their, their objectives and you know, how they're going in green, green, yellow, red in terms of on track for their goals and their, and their projects. Two, we're talking about the values of the organization and how they, you know, I guess how the kind of behaviors, where the opportunities might be to live and breathe them differently. And three, we're talking about their learning and where their professional development gaps are so that in every single month, there is a plan for something that's structured that's going to happen. that's going to help them um, grow professionally on two levels. One, in order to help them be more successful in the stuff that we've agreed that they're going to do. And two, to help them facilitate towards whatever their career ambition might, might, might look like. And I always want to see both of those things because yeah. now the reality is sometimes their career ambition is to stay exactly where they are. Great. Yeah. No problem. Cool. Well, let's Great. just make sure the learning suits that. We'll just be awesome at doing what you're doing in this job. Let's look at those things that can help you stay there. It's not, I think there's this almost, um, We've like inflated, uh, as a society, we've sort of inflated this role of the leader where they're like, that's the most important thing. Everyone needs to be a leader. We all need to be a leader. It's like, 
Uh, I'm pretty sure there's no leader who's ever got anything done without a very wide group of people actually doing the real work. And plenty of people don't want to be the leader. And so let's not put that on a pedestal, but let's still help people be the best they can be in whatever with, their, with whatever context of their goals are available so that learning becomes relevant and it doesn't become overwhelming and it doesn't not get done at all because it's too easy, I think, to feel like you can tick the box. I've given them LinkedIn learning. That's not professional development. That's not real learning. No, we're, we're lucky we live in an age now where there's more information available for free than ever before in human history. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I'm i 58. I, I've learned that if I can't run something, I just go on YouTube and there's a 12-year-old kid that's going to teach me how to fix my phone or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I literally, if I'm doing something, I don't know, I'm just like, put up YouTube it real quick. So we have access, but you, as you said, it can be overwhelming. So part of... There's a great company that, oh man, Better Book Club, a friend of mine, Arnie, runs oh, yeah? it. Yeah, uh, and they, what they do is they have a bookshelf of books virtually. You read them and do whatever you want to do, but you pay, pay your employees to finish a book yeah. and you, you know, assign books that you think will be helpful. And if they, someone recommends it, the key here idea, and I learned this from one of my very first mentors, which is another important part of lifelong learning and career development, a guy named Charlie Owen. And uh, it's when I took over a company uh, as CEO, I was 26. I was in way over my head. Uh, and he would walk into my office every Monday and give me a business book. And he'd say, Friday, I'll see you for lunch. And you got to give me a report. So every for six years, every Monday, I got a book report. Every Friday, I got a book. Every Friday, I had to make a book report. But here's the interesting thing he did that changed everything. I would give the report, talk to him, and he'd ask this question. All right, what are three things you're going to apply? Mm -hmm. And then he would write those down and say, you'll now be held responsible in your job for doing those three things. Here's another yeah. book. Yeah. And it was that, that, that it was one thing to read it. It's a whole nother thing to read it with the idea that I have to implement this and will be held accountable for yeah. implementing the ideas. It's, it's transformational. I mean, if you think about the number of, I, I always think, um, I think back to the days that I learned speed reading. And I remember that the most important principle in speed reading is, um, all of the value in this book is in 2% of the words and the other 98% is examples. So you need to train your brain to look for the 2% of the words and then you need to do something with it because it's the only way that 2% is actually going to make a difference. Like don't, don't be John Spencer, read a hundred books. If you're not going to do anything with it, if you're going right. to read a hundred books and do something with it, fantastic, unbelievable. That's amazing. But don't get yourself caught up in the, in the reading without the applying because you're going to get obviously far more value. I wonder well, though, you... John, whether like, I don't know, I've got, I've got a 17 and a 14 year old and, uh -huh. um, you know, of course, you you want you want everything for your kids that you didn't, you know, everything that you've learned, you want to sort of trans, you know, stick it in their brains and so on. And I found it really difficult to get them to want to do any personal development um, style work. So they're quite capable kids and all the rest, but they don't lean towards books in the same way as I did. But I wonder whether when you and I were growing up, whether there was a... I mean, we didn't have the internet, right? And so there was like all of the wisdom was sitting there in these books. And now they've grown up in this world where there's... Books are like, oh, like some old thing that's sort of out there and there's so much free content and all the rest, but the quality of content therefore goes down and your ability to filter it becomes way more important. Like how do I find good content? Because what does it take to create a book? You know, someone's really had to think about their method and the stories and how it, like, like there's so much that gets concentrated into a book, but on the internet, it's just so cheap and easy to just throw out anything. Now we've got chat GPT and people are just chucking out content that AI is producing for them. It's like, yeah. That may not have been super well thought about and sort of distilled or much have much innovation. How do you think about, do you think that's an issue for the current generation in trying to get them hooked into kind of their own learning? Yeah, there's there's two things. And now I'm going to, so I hope no one under the age of 50 is listening to this because I don't want to get in trouble. But the the I think one thing it's done, it's created impatience. I want the answer now. Mm. I just want to be able to Google it, get the answer and go do it. I don't need to go through the thinking process. I don't need to understand. I just need that the answer. I see mm. that with some of the folks that have interned with me. I'll say, oh, well, you know, yeah. look into this. They come back uh, 10 minutes later. I got them. No, 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 no. That should take at least a full day of research. Oh, no, I went to TikTok. And I'm like, it's the answer is not necessarily on TikTok. It might be there. Mm. But it's, you know, and people, no, you shouldn't read. You don't have to read 100 books. You're like I do. It's my job. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but people go, don't they get redundant? And I go, yeah, they get really redundant. And it's great because that's the pattern. If mm -hmm. I read 100 books on leadership and, you know, that's 10,000 pages or whatever, something more than that, uh, well, a lot more, uh, and it all says roughly the same thing, then I can get a pretty good feel 
that I probably understand the thread that runs through all this. I think that's one of the things that we've lost is people going to eight or 10 or 15 sources and saying, all right, let me, and not only just sources, but people that are well-regarded, well-respected. There's the big idea now, thought leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you, you need to look at an industry and figure out who are the three or four people that are really the, the, the true thought leaders, the ones that are, and then follow those folks. And then the other thing I like to do is when, when they recommend somebody, when, when somebody who I really look up to uh, Jim Collins or Tom Peters or whatever it might be says, I read this book and it's fantastic. Or I saw this TED talk. I'm on it in two seconds. Mm -hmm. If that person who I think is brilliant thinks this is brilliant, I'm headed that way. Absolutely. John, you have, um, I mean, you had this experience as a CEO. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the biggest challenges were that you, did you have challenges that you faced as a CEO that, um, where the principles that you hold true now were sort of informed by that time, like sort of experiences where you're like, geez, if I'd actually known this at that time, I would have been able to resolve that more easily. Or that actually really gave me something that sort of drove my whole thinking pattern around the principles that I've learned. I mean, obviously you're getting a lot of, you're doing this you know, sort of pattern curation almost from all of these sources. But what about your experience as a CEO and how did that link to some of the principles that you hold dear now? Well, there's something that I, I was able to change dramatically between when I was a younger CEO and, and where I am now. When I was, you know, in my mid twenties running a, a company with, you know, doing projects in 20 countries around the world, I had a great team, but at the beginning I was, I was way over micromanaging. Uh, I did not know how to delegate. And I remembered that one day when I looked up and I saw a line of people waiting in the hallway to come to me for me to give the decision. And I realized I was the bottleneck in the whole organization. Yeah. So I brought my team together, our team together, uh, and I said, from now on, there's four levels of decision making in the organization. Level one, your decision, you own it. Positive, you get the, re- the all the benefits. Negative, you take accountability. But don't talk to me. Don't talk to anybody else. Level one, you make the decision. Level two, you make the decision, but you might want to get some input, advice. Uh, maybe not for me as the CEO, maybe the marketing or sales or finance or something, Get some input, then you make the decision and you own the outcome, positive or negative. And if you have to do that a couple of times, it should become a level one decision. Mm-hmm. Level three decision is we're going to make this as a team. We're going to sit, get the appropriate people. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk this through. And then me as a CEO, whatever you all decide, that's what we're going to do. Unless it's something I think will blow up the company. If you all, even if I think we should go this way and you all say that way, I'm going to say, great, I'm going to back you. And if, and if it goes great, you guys get all the credit. And if it goes poorly, I take all the accountability. But I trust you. You're smart people. And if that's what all of you think, I'm on your team. Mm-hmm. Level four is this is my decision. Uh, and, I'm get, and I may get feedback from you all, but I may not. I may just make the decision. I might have a different you know, view than you do. And if you do enough level threes where you trust them, when you pull a level four and say, this is mine, they go, okay, you've trusted us 20 times. We can trust you. And here's what I found out. This is the big learning thing is I probably 70 percent of the the things I the decisions I was making, I shouldn't have been involved in at all. Mm. Probably 55, 60 percent were level one. Uh, All the rest were level two. Rarely do I have to make a level four decision. So what that taught me to do now is it when I hand something away to someone, it ceases to exist in my life. Mm. I'm not going to worry about it. I've delegated it. I know they're bright. If they want advice or input, I'm happy to give it to them. Yeah. But I literally, like you and I were kidding today because I, I didn't realize I have another appointment this afternoon to be interviewed for a book. I don't, and it's, this isn't, I just don't worry about my schedule. I want to mm-hmm. focus on growing the business, doing things, you know, that will help my clients, things like that. So there's a couple of things. I just don't look at it, pull up like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do today. I mean, I literally have gone to the airport and gone, all right, where am I flying today? Oh, Philadelphia, that should be good. Because I trust that all that stuff's been done well by people yeah. who do it very, very well. Yeah, that's awesome. It made, really made me laugh um, because that level four decision, um, you know, it took me a while to realize that I, I was sort of stuck in this model of trying to consult everybody on everything uh, when I was a sort of young executive. And... I remember we had this uh, we had this team uh, team day uh, one day and everyone was had to give each other like a start stop continue uh, on on post it notes and so we, everybody had to do it for everybody and they basically went into the like you'd put the person's name on it but you didn't know who it had come from it like go into the hat and you had to read out yours and so you'd get this it was like really interesting um, you know quite confronting for many people but one of the things was um, my basic team in a nutshell said 
Sean, we love that you want our opinion and we, we love that you trust us and that you want us to make these decisions. And sometimes we know that you really want to make a decision, but you're still trying to consult us. And so we're going to give you like six or seven JFDIs a year. And I was like, what's a JFDI? And they're like, just friggin' do it. And that's like, Sean, full permission to just tell us what to do and we will back you and we will follow you, but don't waste yeah. you know, three days trying to bring us along and trying to coach us. And we're like, if you know what you really want to get done, just make the call, we'll be there because, and to your point, because there was trust and that they were getting enough uh, level threes um, <laughs> and level twos yeah. done. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. Um, John, we're, we're almost out of time, but I'd love to just ask you one final question. Is there anything that I haven't asked you today that you think is in the conversation that we've had is a real kind of missing piece that maybe glues things together or things that you, something you want to get across? So there, there's two things. When I'm asked that question in an interview, there's, there's two things. One is um, with the with all the stress and anxiety and uncertainty and everything, a lot of the folks that I work with are under a lot of pressure and they're burned out. Uh, and it's my plea always to ask for help. Is okay. if, if you're in over your head, you don't have to do it alone. If you're facing depression or you know a lot of difficulties, uh, being the leader doesn't mean you're alone and you don't have to carry the load by yourself. So be courageous enough to be vulnerable and say, I need some help. I don't understand. And, and if it's bad enough, go get professional help. And, and I say that because I'm coaching a lot of executives who are under a tremendous amount of pressure. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really want to send that message out of it's okay to ask for help. Number two, I'd like to pass along the most important thing I've ever learned in my life. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's this. You become what you focus on and like the people you surround yourself with. Whatever you think about, whatever you read, you study, you learn, whatever you fill your brain with and whoever you choose to surround yourself with and spend your time with will directly determine your life a decade from now. It's the exact same with, thing with your business. What your business focuses on, your strategy, your values, your purpose, and the people you surround yourself with in your business will directly determine whether it's successful or, or not. That is 100% true. And you know, what's so interesting about that, John, is you know people often can almost accept that separately like you know they accept it in their personal life like yeah i get what i focus on i know that i might, might need to upgrade my neighborhood and you know, i'm going to become the average of the five people around me or like kind of model and understand that in but may not apply that to business and think about actually the direct connection between the fact that your ability to communicate get clear on that strategy is you telling everybody what to focus on it's what you are personally focused on and then your neighborhood or your peers are the people that are in your business so yeah i really love the connection between those two things i think that's so true thank you for sharing that Oh, my honor, uh, my pleasure. I'm happy to. Well, John, you have um, really, you know, distilled a lot of wisdom. I mean, we know we didn't have a lot of time today, but you distilled a lot of wisdom um, for us today. And I really acknowledge you and thank you for the work that you've done. And I thank you for all of the dedication you've put into reading your 100 books every year, because clearly it's um, it's given you a significant uh, reference set to be able to then try to make things simple is actually not all that easy because you're looking at so much data and so much input. Uh, so I really appreciate the way that you're able to do that because it really helps people to get their heads around it. For people who'd, um, who'd love to hear more or see more or experience more of you, where, where would you direct them to? My website, johnspence.com. Uh, and then if anybody has a question, uh, you know, and the, the, I say this every time, if you've got a question or you want some feedback, you want a book recommendation or something like that, my personal email is john at johnspence.com and I answer all my own email and I'm very serious about this too. If you really want some feedback or something quickly, put urgent or important in all caps at the top of the email and I will stop what I'm doing and read it. And if I don't have the answer, I will find somebody who does and it may be sending them to you and say, John knows this a lot better than I do. <laughs> so, you know, we, we had, I, I, you know this as well. Our job as leaders is to be of service. Absolutely. And there's an old Zig Ziglar quote, if you just help enough other people get what they need, you'll get everything you need. I'm a huge proponent of, of an abundance mentality. Help, 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 and everything will be fine. I'm with you. Thank you very much, John. And thank you for sharing that. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed the show today. If you got value from John's wisdom today, you could help others uh, gain access to it um, by subscribing and leaving us a review because that just helps the podcast get into more hands of more people, hopefully that will be just like you and needing to hear it. Or hit your share button on your phone and send this specific episode to a friend or a colleague who you know would also love it. I don't know you whether you realize this because I this only um, was notified to me by my team about a week ago. In the last 12 months, we actually became uh, one of the top 15% um, most, uh, most shared podcasts in the, in the world. 
Congratulations. Uh, yeah, so that was super exciting. And to me, it's like, that's the most important metric um, is the sharing. Because to me, I mean, our purpose is to help founders fulfill the potential of their businesses so they can maximize the impact they can have in the world and the value they can create in the world. And that only happens if we get into the hands of more founders. So thank you, everybody, who's really, uh, for audience, for, for your listening, for your sharing. And, uh, and that would be an incredible way for you to share uh, John's message. Thank you for your support. You've been listening to the Scale Ups podcast. I'm your host, Sean Steele, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again next week. Thank you so much, John. Really enjoyed the conversation. My pleasure. G'day, everyone. Just a couple of quick things before you go. If you have questions that you'd love myself or an upcoming guest to tackle about challenges that you're facing in scaling your business, please just jump straight on the website, scaleupspodcast.com. You can record your message straight from your mobile by hitting the button on the right-hand side of the page, or you can just email them the old-fashioned way, questions at scaleupspodcast.com. And just a quick reminder, nothing we spoke about today constitutes financial or business advice. If you are considering making big decisions in your business, seek out a professional who can look at your situation in detail and make sure you're getting sound, personalized advice. Thanks for listening. Look forward to being back in your podcast feed next week.